for this talk. We consider whether we can improve on the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. This will lead to the notion of a minimal polynomial for a square matrix A. Now, we start with n by n matrix A with entries in some field F. So F could be the real numbers, the complex numbers, Z mod P, where P is a prime, and so on. The Cayley-Hamilton theorem says, if we form the characteristic polynomial for A, okay, given by determinant Xi minus A, okay, we have a polynomial with coefficients as follows, okay, and the leading terms are one. Then if we convert this over to a matrix polynomial in A, what comes out is the zero matrix. Now, if we consider a simple example, so I'll just take twice the identity matrix. Okay, I could run this A through our machinery here. For the characteristic polynomial, we'll have X minus two to the third power. So we'll have A satisfying this equation here. Now you'll note this equation's overkill because just by observation, we see that A satisfies A minus two times I equal to zero. So if we're looking for polynomials that send our matrix to zero, okay, we could start with a characteristic polynomial, but we might be able to do better. And this is where minimal polynomials come in. Now, our main result, okay, so theorem. First, there exists a smallest degree monic polynomial. Okay, monic just means leading coefficients one. Okay, so I'll give it in this form, such that m sub a on our matrix A is equal to the zero matrix. Okay, and this m sub a is what we're calling the minimal polynomial of A. Now, minimal because it'll have smallest degree with this property, but also because if I have any non-zero polynomial Q, such that if I put A in, we get the zero matrix out, then I'll have to have that m sub a divides Q. Now, one special case of this we know that the characteristic polynomial, when applied to A, gives us zero. So we'll have that M sub A divides P sub A. And we also have, if we have a polynomial Q sub X, which is an irreducible factor of the characteristic polynomial of A, then Q sub X must divide M A. For an example, let's consider the following four by four real matrix. If we work out the characteristic polynomial, we get x minus one cubed times x minus two. By our theorem, the factors of the minimal polynomial are gonna be x minus one and x minus two. We just have to figure out the exponent on the x minus one. Now, it could be one, two, or three. And the only way we find out is by directly checking. So if we check x minus one, x minus two, zero doesn't come out when we put a in. But if we use x minus one squared, x minus two, we put a in, zero comes out, and that's our minimal polynomial then. Now, to show the theorem, we need to understand how polynomials work. So, we'll give a brief review of this. So, for notation, I'm gonna have f adjoin x, okay, so this is in brackets, this is just the set of polynomials in X with coefficients in the field F. If we have ring theory available, then we have that F adjoint X is a Euclidean domain where size is measured by degree of polynomials. That implies we have a principal ideal domain, which implies we have a unique factorization domain. Since we're not assuming ring theory, we'll just state this in plain English using analogies with the integers. Now, noting that f adjoint x behaves like the integers, where we begin with something that everyone believes, that's that we can do long division with polynomials. So if I have polynomials f of x and h of x with the degree of f greater than the degree of h, we can do long division. So that's just gonna say I could find polynomials Q and R, such that we have F equal to Q times H plus Rx. Then the degree of R is between zero and the degree of H. With that, we could then talk about divisibility. So I would say that H divides F, if and only if 
we could find some polynomial q such that f is equal to q times h. From there, when I have degree of f positive, we can consider the version of prime integers for polynomials. Okay, we'll call these irreducible polynomials. So we'll say a polynomial is irreducible if whenever I break up f as a product, m of x times n of x, that implies at least one of m or n is equal to a constant. So we can't split this into two polynomials that have positive degree. For examples, if we're over the complex numbers, then every irreducible polynomial is of the form x minus c, if we insist on monic. So that just means the leading coefficients of one. For the reals, the irreducibles come in two types, x minus a real number, or the irreducible quadratics, x squared plus ax plus b, where a and b are real. And these factor over the complex numbers as x minus c, where c is complex, times x minus complex conjugate of c. Now, if we let the irreducibles stand in for the prime integers, we have the analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So this just means unique factorization. So if f is a polynomial with degree greater than zero, we could factor it as a product of powers of irreducibles. If we insist on monic, we'll be able to fix this constant in our field out in front. Now uniqueness says, if we arrive at another factorization, it's essentially the same as the one that we've already found. So each Q is gonna be one of our P's from before, and for that Q, the corresponding exponents are gonna be equal. Now, with the unique factorization, we talk about greatest common divisor, and then we'll have all the theory that comes in from the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, one useful fact, we have Bazou's identity for polynomials. So if the degree of P and Q are positive, then we'll be able to find polynomials M and N, such as MP plus NQ is equal to the greatest common divisor of P and Q. Now, next step, we'll talk about f of x as a principal ideal domain. We're not gonna go deep into this, but it's worth noting because the ideas will come in the proof. So if i is an ideal, it's gonna be a subset of f of x with the following properties. It's gonna be closed under addition, and if I take an element r in f of x, an element p in the ideal, then the product is just gonna be another element in the ideal. To be a principal ideal says that I can write our ideal as an element in f of x times all of f of x. Then the notation looks like this. So f of x is gonna be a principal ideal domain which says every ideal is a principal ideal. We start the proof of our theorem with an example of an ideal. Recall we're trying to find a monic polynomial of smallest degree such that we get zero when we apply it to A. Now, we define the subset I in f adjoint x as follows. So I is gonna be the collection of all polynomials Q such that Q applied to A yields the zero matrix. I is gonna be an ideal. So we wanna show that I is closed under addition and i is closed under multiplication by elements in f adjoint x. For the first property, if I take p and q and i, then p of a and q of a are the zero matrix. So if I take p plus q applied to a, I get zero plus zero, which is zero. Then we pick some polynomial r in f adjoint x, some p and i, so p of a is zero, then r times p applied to a is gonna give me r of a times p of a. p of a is zero, so zero comes out. That means i is an ideal. Now, we're gonna use i to find our minimal polynomial. First we note, i is non-empty. So zero will be an i, but we also have that the characteristic polynomial of a is an i. So that means we have at least one monic polynomial, which has positive degree. 
Now, because of that, there exists monic polynomials of smallest positive degree. So let's call one of those m sub a. Now, if we pick any q in i, say non-zero, I could form the greatest common divisor of m sub a and q. So I'll call that the polynomial g of x. By Bazou's identity, there exist polynomials s and t, such as s times m sub a plus t times q is equal to g of x, the greatest common divisor. Now, if I substitute in a for x to get a matrix equation, then I have 0 plus 0 equals g of a, which means that g is an element of i. Now, g has positive degree, and it divides both m sub a and q. So, that means, first, okay, well, I have g divides m sub a. Since m sub a is of smallest degree, that means they're equal. But, in turn, that means that m sub a will divide q. So that's the result that we're looking for for the first part of the theorem. For the second part, we apply the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Now, since p sub a applied to a itself gives the zero matrix, part one says m sub a divides p sub a. For the third part, I'm going to show if q is an irreducible that divides p sub a, then q divides m sub a. Now, we'll proceed by induction on the size of a. So for the base case, we assume that a is one by one. So a is just some number c. And we have that the characteristic polynomial and minimal polynomial are equal, both being equal to x minus c. That gives our base case. Now, for the induction step, we'll assume our results true if our matrix of size k by k, where k is less than or equal to n, and I'll assume that a is n plus 1 by n plus 1. Here, we have two cases. First, if p sub a is irreducible, then it must be equal to m sub a, and our result holds. Otherwise, we have that p sub a is reducible, so we can factor it into two polynomials of positive degree. And if we go to the proof of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, we note this guarantees that we can find a basis such that I could put A in block upper triangular form. So we have square blocks on the diagonal, say A1 and A2. We have zeros in the lower left-hand corner, and whatever's in the upper right-hand corner, we're not worried about. Now, that says that we can write P sub A as the product P sub A1 times P sub A2. Because Q is irreducible and divides P sub A, that means Q divides one of P sub A1 or P sub A2. So let's suppose P sub A1. Now, by the induction hypothesis, Q divides M sub A1. So we'll have that M sub A1 divides M sub A, and then that means that Q must divide M sub A. Now, for the step here, just note, if the star here was equal to zero, okay, I would have that M sub A is equal to the least common multiple of M sub A1 and M sub A2. But if we have something here, we're just going to have this least common multiple divides the minimal polynomial of A. So that's how we'll get our result. For more examples, consider the following special cases where the minimal and characteristic polynomials agree. First, we have Jordan blocks. So I'll have a square matrix. We have a single eigenvalue, which we put down the main diagonal. On the diagonal above the main diagonal, we put ones, and then zeros everywhere else. The characteristic polynomial is going to be equal to x minus c cubed in this case, which is also equal to the minimal polynomial, and I'll leave it to you to check that. Now, we'll study these more when we look at Jordan canonical form. Problem with Jordan blocks, if we try to convert to Jordan blocks, our eigenvalues should be in our base field. So if that's not the case, we can use instead companion matrices. Now the idea here, I'll start with a minimal polynomial. Okay, so we have some polynomial. And then we'll convert this polynomial into a matrix. So here what we'll do is, on the diagonal below the main diagonal, I'll put ones. Going up the last column, 
we're going to take the coefficients of our polynomial. Okay, we're going to go up, and then I'm going to put in minus signs. So I'll leave it to you to check, in this case, that the characteristic polynomial is the same as the minimal polynomial is equal to the prescribed polynomial. We'll study these more when we do rational canonical form. Okay, we note here, if I want to convert to companion matrices, there's no problem since I'll stay in the base field. Now, final set of examples, just to indicate what the minimal polynomial tells us. So let's compare here. So in our first example, I have two two by two Jordan blocks. In the second one, I have one two by two Jordan block and two one by one Jordan blocks. Now, if we compare the characteristic and minimal polynomials for both of these are gonna match up. So the idea is gonna be what the minimal polynomial tells us, okay, if we're using, say, Jordan blocks, it'll tell you the size of the largest Jordan block. The only catch is it doesn't tell you what to do with the remaining space. So if I see this, I know I have at least one two by two Jordan block. Then the ways I could fill it in would be another two by two or two one by ones.